गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन So let's start with our class. Hope audio, video, everything is fine. If there is any problem, then please let me know. with that <clears throat> let's start with our class as you know today we are here to discuss microbiology hope audio video everything is fine yeah all good so as you know today i hearty welcome all of you to my class so myself dr nasir and uh, i am a microbiology faculty here so let's start with microbiology sir first point what we need to know is what is microbiology right that is very important so microbiology is nothing but sir micro means small bio means life and logy means study so you know that microbiology is nothing but study of small life and that small life that is what we call them as microorganisms so study of microorganisms is nothing but microbiology so now if you ask me sir why we have to study microbiology otherwise why we have to study microorganisms in the medical field if you ask me that question sir we know that microorganisms they cause diseases and we call them as infectious diseases so diseases caused by microorganisms we call them as infectious diseases so that's why the clinical definition of microbiology is study of infectious diseases lab diagnosis of infectious diseases right that is what is microbiology that is the clinical definition right study of infectious diseases and lab diagnosis of infectious diseases so they cause diseases in humans and that's why we have to study microorganisms in this field that is our medical field now if you talk about microorganisms sir how many microorganisms are there that causes infection in humans that's the question the answer is very simple we have only four types of microorganisms as we all know so the four types of microorganisms are the first is bacteria the first is bacteria second sir viruses viruses third fungi fungi and finally sir parasites sir we have four types of microorganisms that causes infection in humans we know that and when these microorganisms when they enter inside our body to cause infection sir our body is not going to sit quiet and our body will fight back and we have a defense system in our body to fight against these organisms and you know that the defense system is nothing but immunity the defense system is nothing but immunity so this is all about sir microbiology if you have to study microbiology we have to study the organisms that causes infections in humans and also how our body will act against these organisms when these organisms they enter inside our body to cause infections and that is what is immunity so study of microorganisms and immunity and their diseases is nothing but microbiology so once you have understood this earlier you know that we used to study the bacteria all the bacteria in one place all the viruses in one place fungi parasites in one place so to finish microbiology you know that nowadays the pattern has changed in the university exams for second year third year and all see microbiology now these second year students they are in the cbme pattern they are studying system wise like cns systems cns central nervous system then cardiovascular system then respiratory system right respiratory system then gastrointestinal genito urinary system musculoskeletal they are studying system wise so here nothing but see the content is same microbiology is microbiology only the pattern has changed earlier we were studying that microorganism for example staphylococcus right staphylococcus causes infection various infections and how you identify staphylococcus earlier we were studying like this now what we study is in central nervous system also we study staphylococcus because it causes brain abscess then in cardiovascular system also we study staphylococcus because it causes infective endocarditis 
In respiratory system also we study Staphylococcus because it causes nosocomy and pneumonia. In gastrointestinal system also we study Staphylococcus because it causes gastroenteritis. In urinary system also we study Staphylococcus because it causes urinary tract infection. In musculoskeletal system also we study Staphylococcus because it causes osteomyelitis that is bone infection. So now we have to study the same organism and in multiple systems because it involves multiple systems. So that is what is system wise. Right? Organisms, organisms causing infections of central nervous system in one place, organism causing infections of respiratory system in one place, cardiovascular system in one place. So this is what is system wise. Now if you ask me, sir, what is better, which is better to go with the organism wise or system wise? See, I am telling you, if you have read a microbiology organism wise in your second year MBBS, I am telling you go with the organism wise, don't shift to system wise. Don't shift to system wise. If you have studied, if you have studied, if you have studied system wise in second year MBBS, then study system wise, don't shift to organism wise. It is very difficult to shift from one pattern to another pattern, it is not that easy. Right, sir, now if we study organism wise, if we study organism wise, is everything covered? Whatever is there in the system wise, obviously, man. Microbiology is microbiology. We have not added anything extra. Only the method of teaching changes. That's it. Right. So if you attend my classes, sir, I have system wise classes also. I have organism wise classes also in eGuruku lab. And whenever I teach students, those who are in second year, I teach them system wise. And interns and post interns, I teach them organism wise. Because you should not shift from the pattern, whatever you have studied. You can answer all the questions in the exam. Even if you study the even if you study microbiology organism wise, or even if you study system wise, whether you study organism wise or system wise, you can answer all the questions. The only thing is how you have attended the class, how the class is presented, that makes a big difference. Right? That makes a big difference. Sir, once you have understood this, what is microbiology and like system wise or organism wise, I have clarified that. If you have studied organism wise in second year MBBS, continue with the organism wise. If you study system wise, continue with the system wise. Don't try to shift the pattern. It's become very difficult. And uh, ob uh, today, obviously, we are going with them organism wise because this is a class for post intern batch, right? Post intern batch. And you are the student, you, you people, you have studied microbiology organism wise. That's why we study organism wise. So once you have understood all this, first let's start with. Among these, first let's start with right, our favorite. So you know that we are familiar with the bacteria. We are familiar with the bacteria. Most of the bacteria we know. And viruses, few important viruses we know, fungi, few important fungi we know. But the most difficult part as a micro in, in microbiology with respect to students is parasitology. So first we tackle with the most difficult part that is parasitology. So beginning with the parasitology, guys. So let's start with parasitology. Sir, if you talk about the parasitology, first question, sir, what do you mean by parasites? Right? What is parasitology? Sir, parasitology is nothing but study of parasites. And how many parasites are there, sir? We have only two parasites. Only two parasites. Which are the two parasites? The first one is, sir, protozoa. The first one is protozoa and second one is helminths. We have only two types of parasites that causes infection in humans. Protozoa and helminths. So what is the major difference between the protozoa and helminths? The protozoa are unicellular organisms. Protozoa are unicellular organisms made up of only one cell. Right? Made up of only one cell. Right? Unicellular organisms. Therefore, as they are made up of only one cell, right, you can't see them with your naked eyes. You can't see them with your naked eyes. You require the help of microscope to see them. Right? You require the help of microscope to see them. And microscope is nothing but Microscope is nothing but sir, a magnifying instrument. Right? Microscope is nothing but a magnifying instrument which magnifies so that you can see them. So that you can see them. But if you talk about the helminths, sir, helminths are multicellular organisms. Helminths are multicellular organisms. So they are nothing but they are nothing but worms. They are nothing but worms. You can easily see them with your naked eyes. So parasitology means sir, first we have to study regarding protozoa, then we have to move on to helminths. So once you have understood this, let's start with the protozoa. So discussing protozoa first. So if you talk about the protozoa, there are many protozoa, but how many protozoa? 
are important for entrance examination. So if we talk about entrance point of view, we have 16 protozoa which are very, very important. We have 16 protozoa which are very, very important. And these 16 protozoa, right, we have classified into four types of protozoa. So first, we are talking about the types of protozoa. First, we are talking about types of protozoa. Sir, how many types of protozoa are there? Sir, we have four types of protozoa. We have four types of protozoa. Sir, which are the four types of protozoa? And based on what we have classified these protozoa? Sir, protozoa are classified based on the locomotory organs. Based on the locomotory organs they have. The locomotory organs means the organs which helps in locomotion. If you have this, you can move, otherwise you can't move. Same as protozoa, if they have the locomotor, locomotory organs, they can move, otherwise they cannot move. Sir, it is based on the locomotory organs. Sir, based on the locomotory organs, we classify protozoa into motile protozoa and non-motile protozoa. If they have locomotory organs, they can move motile protozoa. If they do not have locomotory organs, they cannot move, sir, non-motile protozoa. Very simple. Once we have understood we have two types of protozoa, motile and non-motile. Among the motile protozoa, among the motile protozoa, what type of locomotory organ they have? Based on that, again, we have three types of protozoa. Because we have three types of locomotory, we can see three types of locomotory organs in protozoa. The three types of locomotory organs are, sir, first one is cilia, second one is pseudopodia, third one is flagella. Few protozoa have cilia as their locomotory organ. Few protozoa, they have pseudopodia as their locomotory organ. And few protozoa, they have flagella as their locomotory organ. So the protozoa which are having cilia as their locomotory organ are known as ciliates. The protozoa which are having cilia as their locomotory organ, they are known as ciliates. And the protozoa which are having pseudopodia as their locomotory organ, these protozoa are known as amoeba. These protozoa are known as amoeba and the protozoa which are having and the protozoa which are having flagella as the locomotor organs are we call them as flagellates. We call them as flagellates and the protozoa which are having which do not have any of these locomotory organs, no, no cilia, no pseudopodia, no flagella. So these protozoa are non-motile protozoa. These protozoa are non-motile protozoa and sir so non-motile protozoa are known as sporozoa. Non-motile protozoa are known as sporozoa. Sir, why non-motile protozoa are known as sporozoa? Because all non-motile protozoa, they contain a special structure inside them and we call them as sporozoids. And we call them as sporozoids. Because all non-motile protozoa, they contain a special structure sporozoids. We call them as sporozoa. Sir, we have two, four types of protozoa based on the locomotory organ. Fine, very good. Right. Then entrance point of view, how many important protozoa? 60. Now the question is, out of the 16 important protozoa, how many of them are ciliates? Means how many protozoa have they have cilia? Sir, only one is ciliate, only one is having cilia. How many of them are amoeba? Sir, five of them are amoeba. That means five protozoa have pseudopodia. How many of them are flagellates? Sir, four protozoa are flagellates. How many protozoa are non-motile protozoa? How many protozoa are non-motile? Sir, five plus one, six, six plus four, ten. 6 plus 10, therefore 6 protozoa are non-motile protozoa. <laughs> Total 16 important protozoa. Out of the 16 important protozoa, now we know that 1 is having cilia, 5 are having pseudopodia, and 4 are having flagella, and 6 uh, they do not have any of the locomotory organ, organs. That's why they are non-motile protozoa, and we call them as sporozoa because they contain sporozoa. Now the question is, sir, which is that only one ciliate? Sir, before moving to then which are the ciliates, which are the amoeba, which are the flagellates. Sir, one more important point, what you need to know is habitat of the protozoa. Sir, first you know the types of protozoa. Now we need to know habitat of protozoa. Habitat means the place where they are present, the place where they develop, where the life cycle of the parasite happens, the place where they cause the disease. That is what is habitat. Sir, everything about the protozoa, everything about the parasite, it happens in the habitat. Development, life cycle, disease, everything happens in the habitat. That's why knowing habitat is very important. If you know the habitat, you know the disease because organism causes the disease at the site of the habitat. Right? That's why habitat is very important. Okay, fine, sir. Let's talk about the habitat. Sir, ciliates. Where are these ciliates present? What is the habitat of the ciliates? The habitat of ciliates is, sir, intestine. Habitat of ciliate is intestine. Sir, ciliates are intestine. <coughs> there is only one cilia and it is <coughs> present in the intestine because habitat is intestine. Amoeba. Sir, if we talk about the amoeba, sir, we have, we have, if we talk about amoeba, sir, we have two habitats for amoeba. Which are the two habitats for amoeba? Sir, one is intestine, 
one is intestine second is free living second is free living sir this is the habitat for amoeba sir free living means what sir the protozoa which freely lives in soil and water the protozoa which freely lives in soil and water are free living sir ciliates are found only in, only in the intestine amoeba are found in either in the intestine or in soil and water the amoeba which are present in soil and water sir they are known as free living fine sir understood sir what about flagellates sir if you talk about the flagellates if you talk about the flagellates sir we have two types of flagellates right based on the habitat based on the habitat sir habitat for flagellates is either intestine or blood and tissue either intestine or blood and tissue sir the habitat for flagellates is either intestine or blood and tissue that means they are present in the intestine or they are present in the blood and tissue two habitats so similarly if you talk about sir non motile protozoa right if you talk about non motile protozoa sir what is the habitat for non motile protozoa the habitat for non motile protozoa is again sir it is either intestine either intestine or blood and tissue either intestine or blood and tissue sir habitat is very important sir first we need to know the type of protozoa then very important what we need to know is habitat of protozoa habitat of protozoa remember ciliates are always intestinal you can find them in the intestine and they cause intestinal disease amoeba they are either intestinal or free living sir flagellates are either intestinal or present in blood and tissue and similarly sir non motile protozoa sporozoa they are also present in the intestine or in the blood and tissue fine sir understood okay fine once you have understood this sir now let's mention the 16 protozoa here sir when we are mentioning 16 protozoa we need to know what is the locomotory organ they have second what is the habitat for them very simple fine sir let's start with our class sir with the coming to the ciliates sir we have only one ciliate there is only one protozoa which is having cilia which is that only one protozoa sir which is having cilia sir answer is balantidium coli sir balantidium coli is the only one protozoa that is having cilia right balantidium coli balantidium coli the only protozoa which is having cilia there is only one ciliate and it is present in the intestine and it is present in the intestine so let's talk about the amoeba sir how many protozoa they have pseudopodia answer is five protozoa have pseudopodia there are five amoeba out of these five only one is in the intestine sir which is that one which is in the intestine answer is ant amoeba histolytica sir ant amoeba histolytica is a protozoa which is present in the intestine therefore it is a intestinal amoeba sir free living sir free living amoeba are four free living amoeba are four there are four amoeba which are present in soil and water sir which are those answer is sir neglaria neglaria acanth amoeba neglaria acanth amoeba sir balamuthia and sapenia neglaria acanth amoeba sir balamuthia and sapenia these are the four amoeba which are free living which freely lives in soil and water so totally five amoeba one is in the intestine four are free living so moving on to the flagellates so if you talk about the flagellates one flagellate which is present in the intestine sir giardia one flagellate which is present in the intestine giardia and there is one flagellate which is present in the vagina sir there is one flagellate which is present in the vagina the vaginal flagellate right one one flagellate that is present in the vagina one flagellate which is present in the vagina sir vaginal flagellate and the flagellate which is present in the vagina is the trichomonas vaginalis trichomonas vaginalis trichomonas vaginalis is the flagellate that is present in the vagina sir the protozoa which are present in the blood and tissue the protozoa which are present in blood and tissue so there are two flagellates which are present in the blood and tissue the two flagellates are the first one is leishmania the first one is leishmania and the second one is trypanosoma leishmania and trypanosoma 
these are the two flagellates which are present in the blood net tissue so totally four flagellates one is in the intestine grd another is in the vagina sir trichomonas vaginalis one two remaining two they are present in the blood and tissue sir leishmania and trypanosoma leishmania and trypanosoma sir moving on to the non motile protozoa sir how many non motile protozoa are there sir we have six non motile protozoa sir which are the six non motile protozoa sir these six non motile protozoa are known as sporozoa three are present in the intestine so three intestinal sporozoa are cryptosporidium cryptosporidium second one is sir cyclospora cyclospora and third one is cystoisospora cryptosporidium cyclospora and cystoisospora these are the three intestinal sporozoa these are the three intestinal sporozoa sir blood and tissue sporozoa are sir blood and tissue sporozoa are three plasmodium plasmodium the bibesia plasmodium bibesia and toxoplasma toxoplasma so these are the six sporozoa three intestinal sporozoa and three blood and tissue sporozoa sir so all the protozoa which are important which are needed for the entrance examination are there in front of you and if you study regarding these protozoa sir we will complete protozoology so we will complete protozoology four types of protozoa are there sir ciliates amoeba flagellates and non motile protozoa that is sporozoa ciliates are only one and it is present in the intestine that is valentidium coli valentidium coli if you talk about the amoeba sir amoeba are amoeba they are having two habitats therefore two types of amoebas are intestinal amoeba and free living amoeba based on the habitat intestinal amoeba is one entamoeba histolytica free living amoeba are four neglaria acanthamoeba balamuthia and sapenia sir similarly if you talk about the flagellates sir we have four flagellates so one is present in the intestine giardia intestinal flagellate giardia one is present in the vagina sir intestinal yeah vaginal flagellate trichomonas vaginalis two are present in the blood and tissue sir blood and tissue flagellates leishmania and trypanosoma so similarly if you talk about the sporozoa three are intestinal sporozoa that is cryptosporidium cyclospora cystoisospora so three blood and tissue sporozoa plasmodium bibesia and toxoplasma so this is what i call it as sir blueprint of protozoa that means all the protozoa in one place we know which are the protozoa we have to study and we have to study this protozoa one by one so before starting this protozoa i want to highlight two things sir what are the two things you want to highlight here so the two things which i want to highlight here is so if you talk about the morphological forms of protozoa if you talk about the morphological forms of the protozoa sir most of the protozoa their morphological forms are trophozoic and cyst most of the protozoa their morphological forms are trophozoic and cyst that means they exist in the form of trophozoic and also cyst protozoa sir when protozoa not all of them not all of them i'm telling you most of them most of the protozoa they exist in the form of trophozoic and cyst trophozoic and cyst that means if you want to see protozoa you can see in the form of either trophozoic or cyst they exist in the form of trophozoic and cyst sir when they exist in two morphological forms the question is in which form they infect humans can they infect in the form of trophozoic can can they also infect in the form of cyst can they infect in both the forms answer is no sir protozoa they can infect in only one form and that one form is cyst the cyst is the infective form cyst is the infective form the protozoa they infect humans in the form of cyst protozoa they infect humans in the form of cyst cyst is the infective form protozoa they cannot infect in the form of trophozoite when there is cyst if there is a cyst they can infect only in the form of cyst so few protozoa they don't have cyst if they don't have cyst they are only trophozoite if they are only trophozoite then they can infect in the form of trophozoite because there is no cyst to infect now they have left out only with one option they have to infect with trophozoite but when protozoa most of the protozoa which are having both trophozoite and cyst sir whenever cyst is present they infect in the form of cyst and they cannot infect in the form of protrophozoite remember this point don't forget most of the not all most of the protozoa their morphological forms are two they exist in two forms trophozoite and cyst and they infect in the form of cyst <coughs> and they infect in the form of cyst most of them and we have four types of protozoa and you know their habitat you know their habitat so with that now we have to discuss these protozoa one by one sir once once we discuss this protozoa what we do is 
sir we won't discuss based on type of protozoa we are not going to discuss first ciliates then amoeba then flagellates or then sporozoa sir we discuss based on the habitat we discuss based on the habitat sir if you see the habitat sir habitat one is intestine one is intestine intestine is a habitat intestinal right intestinal second if you see free living that is soil and water second habitat is soil and water free living third habitat if you see vagina vagina and fourth habitat if you see blood and tissue sir based on the habitat again we have four types of protozoa based on the habitat again we have four types of protozoa sir if you talk about the habitat if you talk about the habitat if you talk about the habitat sir based on the habitat we have first we'll talk about first free living protozoa sir we have free living protozoa the protozoa which freely lives in soil and water the second we have intestinal protozoa second we have intestinal protozoa and third we have vaginal protozoa once again first is free living protozoa right second we'll discuss vaginal protozoa vaginal protozoa the third we are moving on to the intestinal protozoa intestinal protozoa and fourth blood and tissue protozoa sir based on the habitat if you take we have four types of protozoa free living vaginal intestinal and blood and tissue protozoa once you have understood this sir along with the habitat you also need to know the host along with the habitat we also need to know the host right if you talk about the host you know that if we are studying right any organism if we study then obviously man is the host means to cause the disease they have to enter inside man if they enter inside man man act as a host right man act as a host if they enter inside man man act as a host right so man is a host one host is man no doubt in that and all of them they have only one host all of them they have only one host sir free living protozoa they have only one host vaginal protozoa they have only one host intestinal protozoa they have only one host sir except blood and tissue protozoa blood and tissue protozoa they have two hosts blood and tissue protozoa they have two hosts sir why blood and tissue protozoa they have two hosts two hosts because all the blood and tissue protozoa they are present inside vector all the blood and tissue protozoa they are present inside vector as they are present inside vector vector is one host and when this vector bites they enter into humans they enter into humans and humans are the next host two hosts whereas remaining all of them they are not present inside the vector right that's why they have only one host and that one host is man they have only one host that one host is man that one host is man right except blood and tissue protozoa they have two hosts right one is vector and one is man one is vector and one is man they have two hosts so this is about the habitat and host sir so with that now let's discuss one by one first we'll talk about the free living protozoa sir so if we talk about the free living protozoa let's see our blueprint let's see our blueprint sir so how many protozoa are free living are ciliates free living no sir ciliates are only in the intestine are amoeba free living yes sir we have four amoeba which are free living are flagellates and sporozoa free living no sir flagellates and sporozoa they are present in intestine blood and tissue therefore free living means we have only amoeba free living means we have only amoeba and we have only four amoeba which are free living degleria acanth amoeba balaputia and sapini right no doubt so with that let's start with first free living free living let's start with free living free living protozoa sir which type of protozoa free living is what the protozoa which are present in soil and water the protozoa which are present in soil and water are free living that is the first thing second thing sir how many protozoa what type of protozoa are free living sir only amoeba are free living that is very important only amoeba are free living sir how many amoeba are free living sir four amoeba are free living so this is the, these are the first basic points we need to know free living protozoa means the protozoa which are present in soil and water the protozoa which are present in soil and water and the protozoa which are present in soil and water all of them they have pseudopodia as their locomotor organ that's why all of them are amoeba and there are four amoeba which are free living which are present in soil and water sir what's with this basic knowledge let's start discussing free living protozoa so the first point the first point which i want to ask you is sir morphological forms sir what are the morphological forms of free living protozoa like i said most of the protozoa their morphological forms are trophozoic and cyst 
their morphological forms are trophozoite and cyst so their morphological forms are also trophozoite and cyst all of them sir once we know the morphological forms sir second point what we need to know is which is the infective form sir in which form they infect humans i told you wherever is there the wherever cyst is there cyst is the infective form cyst should be the infective form therefore infective form is cyst if infective form is cyst now next question sir when these free living protozoa when they infect humans in the form of cyst what is the mode of infection what is the route of entry of the cyst how this cyst is going to enter sir mode of infection right a route of infection sir mode of infection or route of infection by it by what route it is going to enter sir answer is as you know these are they are present in soil and water and in soil and water also i am telling you they are most commonly or mainly they are present in soil and water mc means most common sir most commonly they are present in water as they are most commonly present in water sir when we come in contact with water when we come in contact with water means swimming for example while we are swimming if that swimming water contains this free living protozoa these free living protozoa they enter by a nose they cross the cribriform plate and there is the brain all these free living protozoa they enter by a nose they cross the cribriform plate they reach the brain and all of them they cause central nervous system infection the root of entry is inhalation sir anything entering by a nose is inhalation inhalation but particularly you need to write sir inhalation while swimming that is important particularly you need to write inhalation while swimming because they are mainly present in soil and water inhalation while swimming okay sir so once they enter via nose while swimming like i said they cross the cribriform plate they reach the brain right they cross the cribriform plate so now they are going to cross the cribriform plate they were going to cross the cribriform plate and finally what happens they reach brain finally what happens they reach you can say central nervous system once they reach central nervous system what are what, what do they cause so they cause central nervous system infection central nervous system infection sir what is that central nervous system infection they are going to cause that's the next that's the next point that is clinical manifestations clinical manifestations what are the central nervous system they are going to cause so they cause either meningitis or encephalitis they cause either meningitis or encephalitis right meningitis or encephalitis if you ask me what do you mean by meningitis sir that is so very simple we all know right if you know the basics of anatomy if you can understand we can understand sir this is brain right if this is the brain infection of brain parenchyma is encephalitis and you know that brain is covered by sir brain is covered by meninges brain is covered by meninges at right? how many layers sir three layers of meninges inner pia mater middle arachnoid mater outer dura mater outer dura mater sir we know that these layers are nothing but meninges meninges inflammation of meninges is nothing but meningitis and this blue color is brain parenchyma right this is brain parenchyma and inflammation of brain parenchyma is nothing but encephalitis nothing but encephalitis Sir, whether it is meningitis or encephalitis, whether it is either meningitis or encephalitis, there is one thing going to happen. Which what is that one thing which is going to happen? So there is increased intracranial pressure. Increased intracranial pressure, right? Increased intracranial pressure is going to happen. Increased intracranial pressure, raise in. Right, pressure of CSF, CSF pressure, increased intracranial pressure is going to happen both in meningitis and encephalitis. When there is increased intracranial pressure, when there is increased intracranial, what is the what are the manifestations? Increased intracranial pressure. Sir, we know that when the intracranial pressure increases, sir, severe headache. Right, when the once the intracranial pressure increases, what happens? We get severe headache. Severe headache. Second, projectile vomiting. Projectile vomiting. projectile vomiting at right, next altered sensorium altered sensorium right and the last thing which is a sign what is that sign papilledema papilledema so these are the four important 
presentation of increased intracranial pressure. This is how intracranial, when there is increase in intracranial pressure, this is how the patient manifests with headache, projectile vomiting, altered sensorium and pepyl edema. When these, clean, when these symptoms uh, or signs, if you see, you know that there is increased intracranial pressure and intracranial pressure increases in both meningitis and encephalitis. So these are the things what we are going to see. Apart from that, sir, when meninges are involved, we are going to see the signs of meningeal irritation. This is signs of meningeal irritation. Sir, what are the signs of meningeal irritation? Sir, we know that signs of meningeal irritation are first one is neck rigidity. Signs of meningeal irritation, neck rigidity. The neck will become very, very stiff, rigid. And when you try to flex the neck of the patient, patient can't do that. In attempt to flex the neck, patient will complain of pain. Patient can't do that, but patient will complain of pain. You come to know neck is rigid. Sir, signs of meningeal irritation, signs of meningeal involvement. That is what is known as neck rigidity. And second is, sir, Brudzumki's sign. Second one is, sir, Brudzumki's sign. Sir, what is this Brudzumki's sign? Sir, when you try to flex the neck of the patient, involuntarily patient flexes his knees. Involuntary flexion of knees while you are trying to flex the neck. Involuntary flexion of knees while you are trying to flex the neck. That is what is Brudzumki's sign. The next Kernick sign. The next sign is Kernick sign. Sir, what is Kernick sign? Sir, when you flex the hip and knees of the patient, flex the hip and knees of the patient, try to extend the knee. The patient can't extend the knee completely. In, if you try to extend the knee completely, then patient will complain of pain and patient can't extend the knee completely. Right? When the patient knees and hip is in flexed position, that is what is known as Kernick sign. So neck rigidity, sir, Brudzumki sign and Kernick signs. These are the signs of meningeal irritation. We have already studied in final MDBS, right? You have already studied in final MDBS. The neck rigidity means neck rigid. Patient can't flex the neck. Brudzumki sign means involuntary flexion of knees when you try to flex the neck. Kernick sign means in not able to extend the knee completely when hips and knees are flexed. That is Kernick sign. So this, the, along with the increased intracranial pressure, if signs of meningeal irritations are there, that will indicate patient is suffering from meningitis. Along with intracranial pressure signs, if there is presentation of seizures, that is nothing but epilepsy. So if you see the presentation of seizures, epilepsy, that, say the that shows the involvement of brain parenchyma. Remember, whenever brain parenchyma is involved, there are seizures. Brain parenchyma involvement may be due to encephalitis or may be due to the tumor in the brain or maybe due to the cyst in the brain, abscess in the brain. So anything when the brain parenchyma is involved, the most common presentation is seizure. So this is the clinical presentation of free living protozoa. They manifest with either meningitis or encephalitis involving meninges or brain parenchyma with increased intracranial pressure. So this is the clinical presentation of all the free living protozoa. So once we have understood this, now the question is, Sir, do all of them they cause meningitis and also encephalitis? All of them means, sir, how many free living protozoa are there? How many free living protozoa? Sir, we've started with the free living protozoa. We know the morphological forms, we know the infective form, we know the mode of infection, we know the clinical presentation. Now, how many free living protozoa are there? Sir, if you talk about the free living protozoa, you can go back to the blueprint. That's why we have our blueprint. Sir, we know, we already know the four, four free living protozoa. We have four free living protozoa and all of them are amoeba. Sir, those are Nedleria and Acanth amoeba, Balamuthia and Sapenia. They are four free living protozoa. All of them are amoeba. Now the question is, do all these four, they cause meningitis or en and encephalitis? That's the question. Answer is no. Answer is no. Right? Therefore, sir, let's discuss one by one. Sir, Nedleria causes what? Right? Sir, Nedleria causes what? Negleria causes what? Sir, Negleria causes a disease which is known as PAM. Negleria causes a disease which is known as PAM. Sir, what is PAM? Sir, PAM means primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. Primary amoebic, amoebic meningoencephalitis. Primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. Sir, this is what is PAM. Primary amoebic. Primary means, primary means are the main infection, the first infection and the main infection of Negleria. Amoebic means, sir, it is an amoeba, that's an amoebic. Meningoencephalitis means it causes meningitis plus encephalitis, that is important. The Negleria involves meninges and also brain parenchyma. It causes meningitis and it also causes encephalitis. Therefore, what we call it as meningoencephalitis, that is Negleria. 
therefore all these manifestations we are going to see in the glaria meningitis ka manifestation also we see and encephalitis ka manifestation also we see because neglaria causes meningo encephalitis and the name of the disease is primary amoebic meningo encephalitis and remember neglaria is very very important sir why neglaria is very very important this is the most common free living amoeba amoeba that causes infection in humans out of these four free living amoeba the most common free living amoeba causing infection in humans is neglaria is neglaria fine sir understood moving on to the second one the second one is sir acanth amoeba the second one is acanth amoeba sir acanth amoeba causes what sir acanth amoeba causes gae sir what is gae sir gae means granulomatous amoebic encephalitis granulomatous granulomatous amoebic encephalitis granulomatous amoebic encephalitis sir what do you mean by that granulomatous amoebic encephalitis so if you see the condition granulomatous sir whenever right you hear this word granulomatous you know that disease is chronic because if you know the basics of pathology we know that granulomas are formed only in chronic diseases granulomas are formed so therefore primary amoebic encephalitis is a acute disease or chronic disease so no doubt in that primary amoebic encephalitis is a acute disease acute disease whereas granulomatous amoebic encephalitis is a chronic disease and that's why we see the formation of granuloma amoebic means amoeba encephalitis amoebic means it is amoeba encephalitis means it is just encephalitis so there is no meningitis there is no meningitis sir apart from this very important point what we need to know is sir acanth amoeba not only it involves the central nervous system it also involves the ocular system it also involves ocular system and it causes contact lens keratitis it causes contact lens keratitis that is inflammation of cornea in only in those people who wear contact lens sir why only in those people who wear contact lens because acanth amoeba is a contaminant of contact lens solution remember this point acanth amoeba is a contaminant of contact lens solution contact lens solution and therefore whenever we keep the lens if contact lens solution is contaminated with acanth amoeba acanth amoeba will enter into our eyes it causes inflammation of cornea and you know that <clears throat> inflammation of cornea is nothing but keratitis and keratitis is nothing but corneal ulcer so acanth amoeba causes corneal ulcer contact lens keratitis corneal ulcer in contact lens wearers so next third free living amoeba so the third free living amoeba is you know that balamuthia balamuthia right and if you ask me sir balamuthia causes what sir balamuthia also causes gae gae that is similar to acanth amoeba granulomatous amoebic encephalitis but balamuthia it cannot cause contact lens keratitis contact lens keratitis is only by ac acanth amoeba and yes as there are granulomatous granulomas are there it is also a chronic disease as granuloma formation is there it is also a chronic disease sir coming to the last one sir last free living protozoa is sapenia sir sapenia causes what sir sapenia causes just encephalitis sapenia causes just encephalitis e means encephalitis there is no association of granulomas no granulomas therefore sir is it a acute disease no it is also a chronic disease sir it is also a chronic disease but there is no formation of there are there is no formation of granuloma sir you know that basics of pathology sir granulomas are formed only in chronic diseases but not all chronic diseases are associated with granulomas therefore sapenia encephalitis is a chronic disease but not associated with granuloma therefore it is not gae it is just e therefore this is important what is important sir neglaria causes pam acanth amoeba causes gae and contact lens keratitis and balamuthi also causes gae balamuthi also causes gae sapenia causes e So now GAE is a disease. GAE, granulomatous amoebic encephalitis, that is caused by acanth amoeba and also balamuthia. Therefore, among these two, which is most common causing GAE, answer is acanth amoeba is the most common causing GAE. So this is all about clinical presentation of. This is all about clinical presentation of free living amoeba. All the four free living amoeba, right? What do they cause? Meningitis, encephalitis. What is the presentation? Now whether they cause meningitis or encephalitis, if you see. that all of them they cause encephalitis but meningitis only by neglaria all of them they cause all the four they cause encephalitis but meningitis only by neglaria that's why what we say is neglaria causes meningoencephalitis 
but remaining three because only encephalitis remaining three they cannot involve they are not going to involve meninges that's an important point they are not going to involve meninges that's an important point right sir why that is an important point see whenever you see the question for example now see this is one of the previous year question right this is one of the previous year question answer please guys i have explained everything you have to answer right you have to answer so if you see this question a girl visits her friend's village developed fever right developed what developed fever developed fever then nasal discharge then vomiting on examination neck stiffness was present brudzinski's sign was positive the neck stiffness was present brudzinski's sign was positive therefore diagnosed it is meningitis diagnosed it is meningitis right because these are the signs of meningeal irritation once you know it is meningitis sir further no need to read the question why no need to read the question because if you see the options Negleria, Acanth amoeba, Palamutia, and Sapinia. Sir, all the four are all the four are free living amoeba, and among them there is only one which causes meningitis. Sir, Negleria. Answer. You got the answer, Negleria. Because meninges are not involved by remaining three, right? Because remaining three, what have you studied? You can see here, sir. Remaining three, we have studied that they cause only encephalitis, right? Highlight this point. They cause see encephalitis, encephalitis, encephalitis. That only negleria causes meningoencephalitis. That is meningitis plus encephalitis. <coughs> if you if you have understood this point, sir, that is enough here. If you have understood this point, that is enough here. So once you say meningitis, options are freely being produced. Done, sir. It is negleria. Further, if you want to read the question, you can read the question. Patient's condition, right? Very important. Patient, con patient's condition, condition, no condition. The patient's condition. Worsened in five days of hospitalization. Very important point, right? Patient condition worsened in five days of hospital. Sir, patient condition worsened in five days of hospitalization. Condition worsened in five days of hospital. What does that mean? So that means they are telling condition is acute. It is acute condition because if it is a chronic disease, chronic disease it progresses very slowly, run for months to years. Months to years, chronic disease can't get worsened in five to seven days of hospitalization. If a condition is getting worsened in five to seven days of hospital hospitalization, so then hundred percent the disease is acute. They are telling the disease is acute, and whenever you hear the disease is acute, options are poor free living protozoa. Then hundred percent again neglaria, because among these four neglaria is the only one that causes acute disease. If you see, that is what we have discussed here. Right, that is what we have discussed here. See, only neglaria causes acute disease. Otherwise, remaining three they cause chronic diseases. So this is the second key point what they have given in this question. So not only one key point they have given two key points. One is there is condition is meningitis. If you know condition is meningitis, among these four meningitis is caused only by neglaria. The condition they say acute. If you know the condition is acute and acute condition they have explained that condition got worsened in hospital within five days. Once you know the condition is acute, again the answer is neglaria. Other three answers are options are not possible as an as answer because they cause chronic diseases. Right. Further, what they have told is repeated CSF examination showed motile unicellular trophozoite. Right. Further, what they have told, sir, motile unicellular trophozoite is seen as shown in the image. This is a trophozoite image. They are telling they saw in the CSF. That is the third key point they have given. Sir, so far we have not studied how to identify the trophozoite. That we study now in lab diagnosis, and we can come back to the same question. We come back to the same question. Sir, with that, we are done with the clinical diagnosis, right? They cause meningitis, encephalitis, everything, acute disease or chronic disease, which involves eye. And what is the disease in the eye, right? Whether they, it causes meningitis or encephalitis, acute or chronic disease, eye involvement is there or not? What are the names of the diseases? And what is the presentation, sir? Everything clear cut with concepts we have explained. So for the first time, you have understood what is meningitis, what is encephalitis, what are the signs of intracranial pressure. And four free living protozoa. How to differentiate? What are the points to remember? Sir, once we have understood this clinical diagnosis, which is very important. Sir, moving on to the next point. Next point is sir lab diagnosis. Next point is lab diagnosis. Sir, how to diagnose by lab? Sir, very simple. Sir, infectious diseases. 
डायग्नोसिस ऑफ ऑल इन्फेक्शियस डिसीजेस पैरासाइटिक हो या वायरल बैक्टीरियल फंगल सर एनी लेटेड विद let it be the any organism all infectious diseases are diagnosed by either detection of either by demonstrating the organism or by demonstrating the antibody in the sample you have to demonstrate the organism in the sample or you have to demonstrate the presence of antibody in the sample so there are only two methods to diagnose either demonstration of organism in the sample or demonstration of antibody in the sample so that's how we diagnose infectious diseases now demonstrate okay either organism or antibody So the question is, how we diagnose? What is this? Parasitic infections. Answer is simple, sir. Parasitic infections are lab diagnosed by microscopy. Lab diagnosed by microscopy, sir. Microscopy means, sir, take the sample, take the sample. Which is the sample we have to prefer? Right now, you have to, sir, you have to tell me the sample, guys. Anybody who can guess what might be the sample we have to take? Right. Anybody who can guess what might be the sample we have to take? Right, what might be the sample we have to take, sir? Very good. Diksha said CSF. Aparna said CSF. Sir, CSF sample because sir, CNS infection. Whether it is meningitis or encephalitis, let it be anything. Whether it is meningitis or encephalitis, let it be anything. Sample is CSF. CSF. So take the sample, CSF sample, and look under the microscope. Look under the microscope. What are you going to see? So now, whether to stain the sample or not, whether to stain the sample or not, sir. In parasitology, we Prefer not to stain because there is no need to stain. There is no need to stain. If there is a need, we use the stains. Usually, we won't prefer the stain. Stains are not needed. Sir, without stain, what we call it as wet mount. Without stain, the preparation we what we call it as wet mount. CSF wet mount. Sir, wet mount means one drop of sample on a glass slide. Look under the microscope. That is wet mount. Wet mount means you have to do nothing. You should not stain. Just take the sample, look under the microscope. That is wet mold. What is the sample here? Is CSF because CNS infection. Take the CSF sample in a glass slide. The glass slide. Look under the microscope. This preparation is known as wet mold. And what are you going to see in the CSF? Sir, in the CSF, I'm going to see what? Obviously, under microscope, I'm going to see the organism. Which is the organism? Protozoa. Which protozoa? Free living protozoa. And what are you going to see, sir? I am going to see in the form of trophozoite and cyst because that is what. Their morphological forms, right? You know already. We have discussed in the beginning. So their morphological forms are trophozoite and cyst. Now we are going to see them in the trophozoite and cyst. Trophozoite and cyst. Sir, now let's draw the trophozoite. Let's draw the trophozoite and cyst. Sir, begin with the first one, sir, Negleria. Begin with the first one, sir, Negleria. Sir, if you talk about Negleria, sir, this is the trophozoite of Negleria. This is the trophozoite. Sorry, once again, once again, guys. You just have to draw reverse. So this is the trophozoite of Negleria. The trophozoite of Negleria. Sir, how can you say that? Because sir, there is pseudopodia. Where is the pseudopodia? Sir, this is the pseudopodia. Why there is pseudopodia? Because sir, these are amoeba. You know that all the four free-living protozoa. Free-living means the protozoa which are present in soil and water. All the four free-living protozoa, the protozoa which are present in soil and what are amoeba. We have four, and all of them are amoeba. Amoeba means all of them they have pseudopodia as their locomotory organ. That you should not forget. So whenever now you draw the organisms, you know that I have to show pseudopodia as their locomotory organ because all of them are amoeba. So in all the four protozoa, whenever you draw the diagram, now you have to show pseudopodia. That you should not forget. Okay, fine, sir. Now draw the pseudopodia. That the question is, there is the pseudopodia, sir. This is the pseudopodia, orange color. What we have drawn. <clears throat> sir when all of them they have pseudopodia when all of them they have pseudopodia now the question is how can we identify when all of them they have pseudopodia sir how can we identify how are we going to identify when all of them have pseudopodia the answer is sir when all of them have pseudopodia how we have to identify is look for the shape of the pseudopodia that is very important shape of the pseudopodia so this shape look like lobe to some person he called it as lobe like pseudopodia If there is lobe-like pseudopodia, sir, sir, now confirmed it is Negleria. It is confirmed it is Negleria. This is the trophozoite of Negleria. So now, if you talk about the cyst of Negleria, so cyst of Negleria is round in shape, round in shape, right? Round in shape with cyst wall and nucleus. What is this? Cyst walls. How many cyst walls are there? Two cyst walls are there. How are they? Are they smooth or irregular or polyhedral? Sir, they are smooth. They are not irregular. They are not polyhedral. They are smooth. Two cyst walls and they are smooth. The two cyst walls and they are smooth. And they are smooth. 
and there is one nucleus. What is this nucleus? Right. So round in shape, two cyst walls, which they are which are smooth, and there is a nucleus inside. Sir, this is the cyst of nigleria. Sir, how will you identify? What is the identification point? Sir, the identification point for <coughs> Proposal is low like pseudopodia and for the cyst is two cyst walls both are smooth because cysts are identified free living protozoa cysts are identified by seeing the number of cyst walls and the nature of cyst walls whether they are smooth irregular or polyhedral but with the neglarious are identified in the csm sample if you see this trophozo tensors you know it is neglaria sir moving on to the next one which is the next one sir next one is acanth amoeba sir if you talk about the acanth amoeba the trophozoite of acanth amoeba is like this Right, the trophozoite of acanth amoeba it is like this it is like this sir where are the pseudopodia sir these are the pseudopodia these are the pseudopodia sir how are the pseudopodia sir somebody said they are thorn like pseudopodia how they are thorn like right thorn like pseudopodia they are thorn like pseudopodia thorn like pseudopodia the thorn like pseudopodia are present are confirmed acanth amoeba acanth amoeba trophozoite of acanth amoeba sir what about the cyst the cyst is sir we have two cyst walls we have two cyst walls outer cyst wall is irregular outer cyst wall is irregular inner cyst wall is polyhedral so this is how we identify sir we have two cyst walls we have two cyst walls but outer is irregular outer is irregular and inner is polyhedral if you see two cyst walls outer is irregular sir inner is polyhedral confirms that this is acanth amoeba sir this is how we identify cyst of acanth amoeba the trophozoite and cyst of acanth amoeba moving on to the next the next one is you know that which is the next one balamothia Balamuthia. Sir, if you talk about the Balamuthia, how is the trophozoite of Balamuthia? Sir, trophozoite of Balamuthia is almost, it is almost similar to, it is almost similar to, right? it is almost similar to Acanth amoeba. Similar to Acanth amoeba. Sir, then how will you identify? That the pseudopodia they are not thorn like second they are branching pseudopodia they are not thorn like and they are branching so we call them as branching pseudopodia right? branching pseudopodia if you see branching pseudopodia that is the trophozoite of balamuthia so if you talk about the cyst cyst of balamuthia the cyst of balamuthia is the only cyst which is having outer irregular cyst wall and inner to smooth cyst walls inner to smooth cyst walls so three cyst walls three cyst walls the outer is irregular outer is irregular and inner to they are smooth Three cyst walls. So the only cyst which is having three cyst walls, Balamuthia, and the only cyst which is having branching pseudopodia, sir, Balamuthia. So this is how we identify Balamuthia. So this is about the trophozoite and cyst of Balamuthia. Are very simple. Sir, moving to the last one, that is Sapenia. Under the last one, sir, that is Sapenia. Sapenia. Sir, if we talk about Sapenia, sir, the trophozoite of Sapenia. The trophozoite of Sapenia is like this. This is the trophozoite of Sapenia. Sir, where are the pseudopodia? So these four, they are pseudopodia. So these four, they are pseudopodia. Sir, how are the pseudopodia? So these are normal pseudopodia. There is no special shape. They are normal pseudopodia. Sir, if they are normal pseudopodia, then how are we going to identify Sapenia? Sir, Sapenia is the only amoeba which is having bilobed nucleus. Sapenia is the Sapenia is the only amoeba which is having bilobed nucleus. Means the nucleus divided into two halves. That is two lobes. Bilobed nucleus. 
bilobed nucleus the normal pseudopodia with bilobed nucleus that is sapenia sapenia now if you talk about the cyst so this is the cyst which is having two cyst walls and both the cyst walls are smooth two cyst walls and both the cyst walls are smooth both the cyst walls are smooth <clears throat> two cyst walls and both the cyst walls are smooth sir if both the cyst walls are smooth if both the cyst walls are smooth then it is looking like the first one that is neglaria if you see the neglaria cyst sir it is also having two cyst walls and both the cyst walls are smooth so then how are we going to differentiate the cyst of neglaria and sapenia that's the question answer is very simple sir sapenia is the sapenia is the only amoeba which is having bilobed nucleus right we have discussed it is only one which is having bilobed nucleus so trophozoite is also identified by bilobed nucleus pseudopodia with bilobed nucleus trophozoite of sapenia cyst also identified by bilobed nucleus right cyst also identified by bilobed nucleus two cyst walls smooth but bilobed nucleus so this is how we identify lab diagnosis of three living protozoa all the four in one place right all the four in one place so one side trophozoite one side cyst if you see all the trophozoites they have pseudopodia because trophozoite contains pseudopodia cyst may there are no pseudopodia sir all of them are amoeba all of them they have pseudopodia but pseudopodia that is locomotor organs you won't find it in the cyst pseudopodia the locomotor organs you can find it only in the trophozoites only on the trophozoites and you are seeing the pseudopodia on the trophozoites and now you know how to identify if i see a trophozoite if it is having pseudopodia if it is having pseudopodia i know the trophozoite is the amoeba trophozoite if that pseudopodia is lobe like pseudopodia lobular pseudopodia 100% that amoeba is neglaria if the trophozoite is thorn like pseudopodia if the pseudopodia is thorn like pseudopodia 100% that amoeba is acanth amoeba if the pseudopodia is having branching if the amoeba is having branching pseudopodia sir 100% balamuthia if the amoeba is having right pseudopodia with bilobed nucleus sir 100% sapenia it is easy sir and if you see a cyst so cyst is round in shape with cyst wall and nucleus cyst means it is round in shape with cyst wall and nucleus if i see two cyst walls both are smooth <coughs> two cyst walls both are smooth and the nucleus is not bilobed the neglaria if i see cyst there are two cyst walls both are smooth and the nucleus is bilobed is sapenia neglaria and sapenia and if i see there are two cyst walls right there are two cyst walls sir cyst is having two cyst walls cyst is having two cyst walls but outer is irregular inner is polyhedral sir 100% acanth amoeba if the cyst is having three cyst walls sir confirmed balamuthia so this is how we have identified the trophozoites and cysts of the free living protozoa so trophozoites may we have to look for the pseudopodia and you have to look for the shape of the pseudopodia and cyst may we have to look for the number of cyst walls and the shape of the cyst walls and that's how we identify the cyst and that's how we identify neglaria acanthamoeba balamuthia and uh, what is the sapenia in the csf sample in microscopy this is the final diagnosis of free living protozoa so free living protozoa diagnosed by microscopy by taking the csf sample because all of them they cause central nervous system infection and these are their trophozoites and cysts sir very easy sir once you are done with the lab diagnosis sir final thing is sir final thing is treatment moving on to the treatment how are you going to treat now sir if you want to treat Right. you can treat neglaria you can treat neglaria sir what is the drug of choice for neglaria sir drug of choice for neglaria is liposomal amphotericin b liposomal amphotericin b that is the drug of choice sir what about others other free living protozoa sir if you talk about other free living protozoa sir others they don't have any treatment others they don't have any treatment the no treatment for acanthamoeba balamuthia and sapenia we don't have treatment we have treatment only for neglaria and the treatment is liposomal amphotericin b sir others if they do not have treatment is what what if we get the infection what if we get the infection sir if we get the infection right if we get the infection then obviously what we have to do is we have to give support to treatment support to treatment if the saturation of the oxygen oxygen saturation is falling down give the oxygen give the iv fluids but if the condition is very severe 
then give the anti-inflammatory drugs like corticosteroids sir we have to give supportive treatment supportive treatment like iv fluids anti-inflammatory drugs and oxygen if oxygen saturation is coming down sir we have to give supportive treatment we have to support the patient so that patient can recover on its own <clears throat> if patient can't recover this patient has to die because we don't have any treatment to act against these organisms we have treatment only for nuclear and the drug of choice is liposomal amphotericin b and sir this is all about free living protozoa guys hope you enjoyed free living protozoa hope you are enjoying parasitology and hope i think you are first time understanding parasitology what is what is parasitology what are these negleria canthamoeba right what are the morphological forms forms means what what is the infective form how they are going to infect how they are going to enter why they cause meningitis encephalitis how to differentiate them right which one causes meningitis which one causes encephalitis which one causes acute disease which causes chronic disease how what are the signs of meningitis irritation how to identify meningitis what are the signs of encephalitis how to identify encephalitis in the question so what is the treatment why others they don't have treatment and if they do not have treatment then how we are going to treat them right so many things right what we give is we, we teach with concepts right so that your concepts will get clear and you will understand better because once you understand you never forget that is one thing the second not only we deliver with concepts we also see to it we also see to it that you can remember the things what we have discussed just imagine i delivered the concepts you say yes sir understood fine sir nice class i understood and uh, tomorrow if i ask tomorrow i ask can you tell me whatever i have taught you yesterday and if you say sir yesterday i understood everything but today i remember nothing right if that's the case then what is the use of teaching and making you understand with concepts sir we have to understand it better and we have to remember also better if you see how easily and beautifully you can remember because it is like a story sir like free living protozoa means which are freely see first we start with protozoa first we started with parasitology i told you we have only two parasites protozoa helminths clear cut concepts now you know we have only protozoa and helminths once i say protozoa i kept all the protozoa in front of you and you know all the protozoa now whenever i say any protozoa sir, suddenly if i say giardia you can see the blueprint i can say sir giardia is a intestinal flagellate intestinal flagellate means what sir it is present in the intestine it is having flagella see you know something you know where that organism comes and what is its habitat what is its locomotory organ so in that case we just put all the protozoa in one place i familiarized with you which are the protozoa which are present and what which are the protozoa we are going to study and which are the protozoa which are important for entrance examination so once we came to know then we started studying studying parasitology based on the habitat then you know we have four types of habitat we know from the first blueprint so pre living vagina intestinal blood and tissue Four types of sir. We started with the free living. Now till we came here, you know what do you mean by free living, sir? We know free living means soil and water. And till we came here, you know which are the protozoa which are free present in free living, sir? Only amoeba are present in free living from the bus for blueprint, you know. And you know that there are only four. You know the names also: Nickelodeon, Balamutia, Tacantha, Amoeba. And you know that till we came here, you know that all of them they are having the morphological forms, trophozoite and cysts. And you also know that cyst is the infective form, right? With this. actual discussion started from mode of infection now again see it is everything is everything is related you just have to know you know that because they are present in soil and water because they are mainly present in water obviously they can enter when we come in contact with water and that's why we acquire this infection while swimming and while swimming they enter via nose as they enter via nose they cross the cerebral form plate they reach the brain that's why they cause central nervous system infection and they cause only central nervous system infection meaning that is encephalitis guys you have finished final year mbbs you have studied meningitis encephalitis and i not all of you i agree but most of you i don't think right you have studied meningitis encephalitis in this way what is meningitis what is encephalitis and what is the presentation in meningitis what is the presentation in encephalitis right in both the cases intracranial pressure rises then in both the cases you can see all these things now tomorrow when you see seizures in the question now you know examiner is talking about encephalitis tomorrow if you see signs of meningeal irritation in the question you know examiner is talking about meningitis by chance tomorrow if you see in the question signs of meningeal irritation and also seizures now you know examiner is talking about meningoencephalitis examiner is talking about meningoencephalitis and once you know what examiner is talking about then all the four free living protozoa when you kept in front of you you know that nickleri is the only one causes meningitis and meningitis plus encephalitis that is meningoencephalitis nickleri is the only one which involves meninges remaining all they involve only brain encephalitis and 
Leggett is the only one which causes acute disease, remaining all chronic diseases, and a cancer amoeba is the only one which involves ocular system, and no other free living amoeba can involve the eye, that is ocular system. So this is what is important. Right? Once you know, now you know that sample should be CS because because the disease is meningitis encephalitis and once you know sample is the csf what you see in the samples samples are protozoa sir how are you going to see now you know the morphological forms are trophozoite and cyst how will you identify the trophozoite by seeing the pseudopodia because you know all of them are amoeba all of them are amoeba means all of them are they have pseudopodia but if all of them they have pseudopodia then how are we going to identify for that now you know that we have to look for the shape of the pseudopodia lobe like sir neglaria thorn like sir acanth amoeba sir branching means balamuthia sir Normal pseudopodia with bilobe nucleus opinion. So then what about the cyst? Now you know that cyst means it consists of cyst wall and nucleus. And we have to identify based on the number of cyst walls and the shape of the cyst walls. Two cyst walls are smooth, neglaria and tapenia. We can identify by seeing the bilobe nucleus, no bilobe nucleus, neglaria, bilobe nucleus, sapenia. The two cyst walls, outer irregular, inner polyhedral, acantha amoeba, three cyst walls are balamuthia identified. Coming to the treatment, the drug of choice for neglaria is liposomal amphotericin B and there is no treatment for others and we have to go for the supportive treatment. Complete picture, like a story with concepts, understand everything you can remember. You never forget. You never forget. Sir, everything mode of infection is inhalation while swimming, 100%. All of them, all the four mode of infection is inhalation while swimming. Sir, if only cysts are infectious, from how can we see trophozoites in microscopy? Okay, good question. If only cysts are infectious, then how are we going to see trophozoites? See, with that, I want to explain one thing. <clears throat> when Once the cysts, they enter. How they enter? Via inhalation. Via inhalation, they cross the cribriform plate and finally, there is the central nervous system. Sir, once the cyst reaches the central nervous system, remember this, cysts, they can't cause the infection. Cyst has to rupture and cysts, they rupture. Trophozoids, they come out. Once cyst ruptures, what comes out? Trophozoid. Cyst contains trophozoid. The cyst, they, reaches, they reach the central nervous system. This ruptures, right? And trophozoid, they come out in the central nervous system. These trophozoids, they cause meningitis and encephalitis. Once these trophozoids, they cause meningitis and encephalitis, Again, these trophozoids, they become cyst. Again, these trophozoids, they become cyst. Right? So, this process, in this process, trophozoids are multiplying and trophozoids are becoming cyst. Trophozoids are multiplying, they are becoming cyst. As trophozoids, they multiply. Sir, you see trophozoids also. And as the trophozoids are becoming cysts again, you see cysts also. Hope you got the answer. Once again, I'm telling you, for all the, for all the protozoa, infective form is cyst, you know that. Once cyst enters, it ruptures inside to release trophozoid. Cyst ruptures inside to release trophozoid. Trophozoid causes the disease, trophozoid multiplies, and trophozoids become cyst again. Before, as trophozoids are multiplying, you can see the trophozoids. As the trophozoids they become cyst, you can see the cyst. So both can be seen in the sample. Very good question. I appreciate the question. Right? Who asked the question? Okay, Sachin Reddy. Sir, both the forms are seen. Sachin Reddy. Right? Good question. So, as cysts, uh, as trophozoids multiply, you can see trophozoids, and as trophozoids become cysts, you can also see cysts. All the cysts which enters in humans, they rupture to release a trophozoid, then the disease and life cycle occurs. So, this is the entire life cycle. This is the entire life cycle. Okay, once you have understood this entire thing, the last thing I want to mention, what is that? The trophozoids are also seen, cysts are also seen, but there is one catch point here. The catch point is, Cysts of neglaria and acanth amoeba, right? Once again, I'm telling you, cysts of cysts of the first two, the cysts of first two, neglaria and acanth amoeba. So their cysts, their cysts are not seen in CSF. I'm not telling cysts are not present. I'm telling they, they are not seen in CSF. If you take the brain biopsy, you can see. If you take the brain biopsy, you can see. Even in the brain biopsy, acanthamibica cysts are not seen. Leave that, but neglerica cysts can be seen. But whatever it is, see, we should not go into depth. You have to study whatever is needed for the entrance examination. Whatever is not needed, if you study, we get confused. Sir, whatever needed <coughs> that I'm telling, remember, cysts are there, cysts are present, but not released in the CSF, only for neglaria and acanthamoeba. These are not released in the CSF. Not released in the CSF. That's why they are not seen in the CSF. 
But if you take the brain biopsy, you can see the cyst. But brain biopsy is an invasive procedure. There are so many complications associated with that. That's why we won't go for brain biopsy in live patients. Right? So nowadays we won't perform brain biopsy in live patients. And if you take the brain biopsy, you can see the cyst. But we don't want to take. Alternate sample is CSF. In the CSF, we can see only trophozoids for Negleria and Acanthamoeba. Only for Negleria and Acanthamoeba. Whereas Balamuthia and Sapinia, we can see both trophozoids and cysts. For Balamuthia and Sapinia, we can see both trophozoid and cysts. Hope you have understood and hope there are no doubts. If you have any doubts, you can ask. I will clear. Sir, only cysts can enter into body. Okay, very good question by Nivedita. No, even trophozoids can enter. Why only cysts? Even trophozoids can enter. Remember, trophozoids are very delicate. Usually, they get destroyed in the environment. They get destroyed in the soil and water. They are very delicate. They get destroyed in soil and water. So that's why we won't get infect infection with trophozoids. Because they are very delicate. They get destroyed. They can't survive the extreme hot, extreme climate. And these conditions, they can't survive. Cyst is resistant. It can survive in the even, even in the extreme conditions. And that's why we get infect infection. That's why we get infected with the cysts. And that's why trophozoids, they can't infect. Because they are delicate. They get destroyed. Very good question by Vedita. So moving to the next, vanilla. Sir, human to human spread by a droplet is possible. Human to human spread is not possible. Human to human spread is not possible by free living protozoa. The only possible infection, mode of infection is inhalation while swimming. That is the only possible mode of infection. Other mode of infections, even if they enter, they can't cause the disease. They cannot cause the disease. Only possible mode of infection by which they can cause the disease is inhalation while swimming. Human to human spread is not there. Sir, while we swimming, can they enter via mouth? Very good question, Akhil. And that's why I told you, Akhil, while swimming, yes, they can enter via mouth. Why not? If they enter via mouth, they go, they go to the stomach and intestine. intestine. But in that case, sir, they cannot cause the disease. They are not pathogenic by any other route. See, all the organisms, if you take no. So they are pathogenic only by particular mode of infection, particular route of entry inside the body. But other routes, if they enter, they are not pathogenic. They are not pathogenic. But they can take trichomonas vaginalis. If it enters via sexual route, it causes vaginitis. If it enters via oral and inhalation route, there is no vaginitis. And it won't cause any other disease. Sir, all, that is the basic rule. Sir, all organisms, they can cause diseases only if they enter via particular route. They cannot cause infection by all routes of entry, all modes of infection. Sir, for diagnosis of neglaria and acanthamoeba, trophozoids in, yeah, for diagnosis, only trophozoids, which can be seen in CSF. This can be seen, but we have to take brain biopsy, but we won't take brain biopsy in, biopsy in live patients. That's why we have to rely only on the trophozoids in the CSF sample for the diagnosis of neglaria and acanthamoeba. <coughs> for Balamuthia and Sapinia, we can see both trophozoids and cysts. Anyways, I have cleared all of your doubts and uh, you have asked very good doubts. Right. So good guys, you are into the class, you are listening to the class, you are understanding the class. I'm happy by seeing your doubts that you people are showing very, uh, you, you people are showing a good interest. So with that, before taking a break, sir, we cover the vaginal protozoa and then we take the break because the vaginal protozoa is only one. You know that we have four free living protozoa and we are completed and vaginal protozoa, there is only one. Sir, in five to ten minutes, it, it will get, it will get over. Sir, beginning with the vaginal protozoa. Beginning with the vaginal protozoa. Yeah, before that, let's go back to this question which I told you. Go back to this question which I told you will come back after some time. So if you see this condition, this, they told okay, CSF sample may use a motyl trophozoid. And this motyl trophozoid, now you have to identify. So now you know how to identify. Sir, very easily you are seeing this trophozoid. You are seeing what pseudopodia and how is the pseudopodia? The pseudopodia is a lobular pseudopodia. Lobular means lobe-like pseudopodia. See, in this question, examiner told the disease is meningitis. That is enough to identify neglaria. Examiner gave you one more point. Acute disease. That means now examiner is requesting you, please answer neglaria. I have given you two key points. After that, examiner gave you the trophozoid showing lobular pseudopodia. Lobular pseudopodia. Now the examiner is right holding your hands. Right, holding your hands. Man, at least now please answer Negleria. <laughs> right? Even after that, if you answer wrong, what can I say? That's what examiner is telling. By giving you three three key points in the question, please answer Negleria. Don't do wrong. 
have given you three key points even one key point is enough to come to the answer in this question even one so similarly if you see yeah fine with that moving on to the vaginal protozoa moving on to the vaginal protozoa sir vaginal protozoa means the protozoa which are present in the vagina how many protozoa are present in the vagina sir only one protozoa which are only one protozoa is present in the vagina which is that for that we have to go back to the blueprint guys come back to the blueprint so see how many protozoa are present in the vagina only one which is that so that is trichomonas vaginalis trichomonas vaginalis is the only one present in the vagina and it is a flagellate you see the blueprint it is a flagellate so trichomonas vaginalis is a flagellate flagellate means it contains flagella as its locomotor organ and it is present in the vagina so trichomonas vaginalis is a vaginal flagellate that is important sir vaginal protozoa is present in vagina and you know that it is a flagellate only flagellates are present in the vagina <coughs> only flagellates means ciliates are not there uh, uh, ciliates are not there amoeba are not there sporozoa are not there in the vagina only flagellate are there and there is only one flagellate which is present in the vagina and the name of that flagellate is a trichomonas vaginalis trichomonas vaginalis sir name of that flagellate is trichomonas vaginalis trichomonas vaginalis right sir same under the same six points we have to discuss the six points what we have discussed here right totally how many points we have discussed here six points which are the six points we have discussed for free wing protozoa <coughs> sir first is morphological forms then infective form then how that infective form going to enter once it enters what is the disease it causes once it causes the diseases sir how are you going to lab diagnose it once you have diagnosed it sir how are you going to treat it sir very simple then now vaginal protozoa under the same headlines first is sir morphological forms sir what are the morphological forms of vaginal protozoa that is trichomonas vaginalis sir answer is very simple trophozoite and cyst but there is a one catch point here what is that the catch point is sir trichomonas vaginalis exist only in the trophozoitic form exist only in the trophozoitic form there is no cyst very very important point there is no cyst it is present only in the form of <coughs> it is present only in the form of trophozoite there is no cyst very very important never forget sir whenever you hear trichomonas vaginalis the first thing that has to come to your mind in front of your eyes is there is no cyst very important there is only trophozoite sir once you have understood this sir once we know the morphological form now we need to know the infective form sir as there is only one morphological form obviously that should be the infective form and that is the infective form that's trophozoite sir but you say trophozoite they cannot act as infective form they are very delicate structure they will get destroyed yes man but, but there is no cyst here as there is no cyst and it exists only in trophozoite and it is causing the disease then obviously it has to infect humans in the form in which it is present it infects in the form of trophozoite sir how it is going to infect what is the mode of infection what is the route of entry sir if we talk about the mode of infection so the mode of infection is sexual route it enter via sexual route that means that that means it is a sexually transmitted infection it is a venereal disease sexual disease right why a sexual route once it enters sir once it enters it causes the it causes the inflammation in the vagina and no doubt in that it causes a disease vaginitis it causes a disease vaginitis and once you locally examine this examine this examine the vagina when you do the local examination of the vagina you see inflammation red color inflammation redness everywhere and there are few white color dots in the vagina in case of trichomonas vaginalis vaginitis so red inflammation with white color dots to some person appear like strawberry and this person called it as strawberry vagina right this person called it as strawberry vagina so why strawberry vagina because inflammation with white color dots in the vagina that gives a look strawberry and that's why called as strawberry vagina fine sir understood now if you talk about the vaginitis sir what is the presentation of vaginitis sir vaginitis means we know sir manifest with vaginal itching and vaginal discharge manifest with vaginal itching and vaginal discharge that is the manifestation vaginal itching and vaginal discharge sir how is the vaginal itching right mild or severe sir vaginal itching is mild mild vaginal itching not severe severe vaginal itching we see only in fungal vaginitis sir here mild vaginal itching sir how is the discharge sir discharge is yellowish green color sir first you have to look for the color of the discharge yellowish green color then you have to look for the consistency sir thin in consistency then you have to look for the smell 
whether it is foul smelling or non foul smelling it is foul smelling how is that foul smell that foul smell is fish like smell sir fishy smell so this is how you have to explain the discharge <coughs> sir itching you have to explain in the severity mild moderate or severe here mild itching the general discharge you have to look for the consistency color and smell consistency color and smell consistency is thin color is yellowish green smell is fishy smell right fishy smell so this is the clinical presentation of parasitic vaginitis that is trichomonas vaginalis sir one thing entrance point of view which you should not forget sir color yellowish green color which you should not forget why sir wherever you get sir vaginitis due to any cause vaginitis due to any cause bacteria fungus virus any cause always remember vaginal discharge is white in color white in color in all the cases vaginal discharge is white in color if you see colorful discharge yellowish green 100% parasitic 100% trichomonas vaginalis sir color is very important to identify sir whenever you see tomorrow you see a question on vaginitis in the exam see the color first if it is green or yellow color sir 100% answer parasitic trichomonas vaginalis if it is white means you have to think of other causes but if it is a colorful discharge 100% parasitic trichomonas vaginalis sir this is the clinical presentation sir once you know the clinical diagnosis sir moving on to the lab diagnosis lab diagnosis at told you all parasites are diagnosed by microscope all parasites are diagnosed by microscopy so obviously what is the sample we are going to take the sample what we are going to take is vaginal discharge or you can take urine urine sample also accepted but vaginal discharge is the better sample vaginal discharge or urine and like i said usually we won't go for stain stain in case of parasites we stick to wet mount sir vaginal discharge ka wet mount Okay, fine, sir. I have taken the vaginal discharge of vitamin. What are you going to see, sir? I am going to see. You should never forget only trophozoid because you know that there is no cyst. There is no cyst. There is only trophozoid. Okay, what is the locomotory organ that you should not forget, sir? It is a flagellate. Trichomonas vaginalis is a flagellate, sir. I have to show the flagella. I have to show the flagella, <coughs> sir. I have to draw only trophozoid and I have to show the flagella. That is very important. Let's draw the trophozoid. So the trophozoid of trichomonas vaginalis looks like this. Trichomonas vaginalis. The trophozoit of trichomonas vaginalis looks like this. Looks like this means how it is. To some person it appeared like. So to some person it appeared like badminton racket in shape or tennis racket in shape. Sir, badminton racket shape or tennis racket shape, whatever you call, right? Badminton racket or tennis racket shape, and there is one axo style at the center, and there is one axo style at the center, one axo style. Sir, what is this axo style? It is nothing but a median partition which divides into two halves, which divides the body into two halves. Median partition, one axo style, and sir, there is one sucker. that is important sir there is one sucker there is one sucker sir what is this sucker sir sucker helps in attachment sucker is a organ of attachment it helps the trichomonas vaginalis to attach firmly to the vagina to cause inflammation to cause vaginitis it helps in attachment and like i said it is a flagellate to show the locomotor organ what is the locomotor organ flagella how many flagella are there five flagella where are they present sir four flagella four flagella they are in front four flagella they are in front fifth flagella is lateral fourth four flagella they are in front fifth flagella is lateral total five flagella right totally sir we have five flagella four flagella in front fifth flagella is lateral lateral flagella is folded folded flagella so lateral flagella is lateral lateral flagella is folded we call it as folded flagella recurrent flagella or flagella with undulating membrane no need no need to remember because they won't ask what you have to see is full dead flagella in simple words try to understand don't complicate things remember this for entrance examination don't complicate things try right? keep it simple keep it simple mnemonics are important but avoid too many mnemonics right very important avoid too many mnemonics because too many mnemonics you get confused among the mnemonics right wherever you feel it is difficult you need a mnemonic fine multiple mnemonics thousands of mnemonics avoid mnemonics even i use this mnemonics i use mnemonics i use mnemonics but remember wherever it is possible we have to we try to avoid mnemonics see so far i have not used any mnemonic why because sir full of mnemonics at that moment you feel wow but after that you, you try to recollect things so difficult to recollect because so many many mnemonics means few mnemonics means understand you can remember the many mnemonics you will get confused avoid too many mnemonics like like you know the rule of nature right too much is too bad rule of nature too much is too bad so 
like the too many mnemonics are too bad you will get confused you can't remember few mnemonics okay acceptable anyway sir five flagella <coughs> one flagella is folded lateral flagella and uh, five flagella is over sir when we look under the microscope when you look under the microscope you see this trophozoite of trichomonas vaginal is moving here and there in the under microscope you can see it is moving here and there because it is having flagella it is motile but it shows a characteristic motility a special type of motility we call it as jerky motility a special type of motility what is jerky motility so the characteristic motility of trichomonas vaginalis is jerky motility and jerky motility is a special type of twitching motility jerky motility is a type of twitching motility see sometimes examiners may use the word jerky motility sometimes examiners may use the word twitching motility you should not get confused the actual may it is jerky motility but jerky motility is a special type of twitching motility sir all these points are important to identify the trophozoites trophozoite of trichomonas vaginalis how will you identify sir badminton racket in shape right leaf like don't say leaf like there is no word leaf like <laughs> it is badminton racket shape okay i know where you are confused leaf like falling leaf motility that is for giardia that we study in intestinal protozoa here there is no word of leaf it is badminton racket shape there is one axostyle there is one sucker there are five flagella four in front fifth is lateral lateral flagella is folded with a characteristic motility jerky motility or twitching motility so this is how we identify the trophozoite of trichomonas vaginalis in the vaginal discharge cavet mount sir so diagnosed sir once you see vaginal discharge clinically you know it is vaginitis and if you see trichomonas vaginalis ka trophozoite in the diagnosis it is trichomonas vaginitis sir so diagnosed once the diagnosis is done sir moving on to the treatment so the last part if you could talk about the treatment the drug of choice is the drug of choice is sir metronidazole the drug of choice is metronidazole 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 sir, now this is all about see vaginal protozoa entire vaginal protozoa here in your place in one place sir very easy to read and revise trichomonas vaginalis see if you try wise you can revise in 30 seconds morphological forms only trophozoite no cyst infective form trophozoite root of entry sexual root what does it cause vaginitis how is the vagina strawberry vagina what do you see clinical clinically what are you <coughs> clinical presentation vaginal itching and vaginal discharge how is the vaginal itching mild how is the vaginal discharge thin yellowish green with fishy smell with fishy smell microscopy sir vaginal discharge you see trophozoite and you know five points to identify the trophozoite the treatments are metronidazole done with the vaginal protozoa there is only one sir trichomonas vaginalis sir this is a std then this parasite doesn't cause any disease in man yes this is a std sexually transmitted infection this parasite doesn't cause any disease in man oh man means you are telling males males i don't know man man means they are talking about infection in man only i have not understood your question i think you are thinking of male males 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 also it can cause this is it can it causes urethritis trichomonas vaginalis in males it causes urethritis in females also it can cause urethritis but mainly vaginitis so in males also it is transmitted by sexual route and obviously don't say vaginitis in males <laughs> don't say vaginitis in males right because i still remember in one magazine i saw there was a big headline in one magazine i saw there was a big headline nowadays prostate cancer is increasing especially in men that's what they mentioned right nowadays prostate cancer is increasing especially in men that's what they mentioned in a magazine so oh, half of i know half of you have understood half of you not right prostate cancer increasing especially in men They're like don't say vaginitis in man man means yes males yes there is no vaginitis in males no doubt in that it can cause infection in males also it causes urethritis it causes non gonococcal urethritis it causes non gonococcal urethritis in males sir without anyways this is about the vaginal protozoa sir without if you see now if you see now sir we have completed we have completed right free living protozoa sir we have completed free living protozoa right four free living protozoa and we have completed one vaginal protozoa sir free living protozoa is over vaginal protozoa is over now what is left is intestinal protozoa and blood and tissue protozoa we are taking a short break right we are taking a short break now the time is 
consider it as 12:20 consider as 12:20 come back by 12:40 sir class will resume by 12:40 and yes this is a tea break this is a tea break guys lunch break i am going to give you at 2 o'clock right one more session we are going to uh, one more session will be there after this tea break a short session within 2 o'clock i will try to give you the lunch break short tea break hope you enjoyed microbiology and hope you have understood microbiology for the first time and after that you have confidence that yes sir i can retain this in my mind i can revise it faster it is very easy so with that guys with, with that guys see you after the break all the best read well see you at 12:40 thank you hope you enjoyed the session